Multiple black and white images of the moon speeding towards the camera fascinate television viewers around the world as a US probe slams into the lunar surface. The Ranger series of probes were designed to take high resolution photos of the lunar surface for evaluation of possible landing sites. Of the series, throughout the early and mid 60s, some nine missions were flown. The first were launch failures, Ranger 3 missed the moon completely, Ranger 4 impacted, 5 missed and 6 impacted, but the onboard camera failed. Rangers 7, 8 and 9 all performed well, revealing several locations on the lunar surface worth investigating further. NASA was trying its hardest to keep alive its goal of putting a man on the moon first. Two months before Ranger 3 launched, Major John Glenn, Navy fighter pilot, combat veteran, Trans-American flight speed record holder and astronaut, prepares to ride the Atlas booster aboard his Mercury spacecraft, Friendship 7. The Atlas had had a checkered history as the first operational US ICBM, but proved its worth by launching Glenn into orbit. The Mercury test flights had been numerous, six flights with the Redstone booster and six with the Atlas. It weighed in at 260,000 pounds at launch and was slightly taller than Redstone. Glenn was given the go-ahead for three orbits by mission control, and he settled down to his five-hour journey. Early into the flight, Glenn surprised mission control with the observation of thousands of fireflies swarming around the capsule. They were unable to explain the phenomenon. During his final orbit, an alarm alerted Mission Control to a possible fault. It indicated that the landing bag had deployed, possibly causing the heat shield to detach. Without the heat shield, the capsule could not withstand the heat of re-entry into the atmosphere, and the craft would burn up in the searing 3,000 degree temperatures. The ground crew could do nothing. They recommended to Glenn that the retropack, which was held in place by metal straps over the heat shield and which normally jettisoned prior to re-entry, should be kept on and hopefully keep the heat shield in place. Friendship 7 descended toward Earth. Everyone held their breath. The retropack held and the heat shield was successful. Glenn reported his parachute was good and chatted with the recovery team whilst he drifted down to the sea. John Glenn was the hero of the hour, the first American to orbit the Earth and the first to avert a potential disaster. The United States was still in the race. President Kennedy himself flew down to pick Glenn up in Air Force One and whisk him back to the nation's capital for the celebrations and media coverage, ticker tape parades, and a speech to Congress. Scott Carpenter served as backup pilot to Glenn, but had his own opportunity to ride aboard Aurora 7 some three months later. May 25, 1962, another successful Atlas launch. A planned three orbits, identical to Glenn's, were to include some scientific observations. Notably, fluids in weightlessness, photography of the Earth's surface, 
and an unsuccessful attempt to spot a flare fired from the ground. One mystery was solved, however, John Glenn's fireflies. On the final orbit, Carpenter inadvertently knocked the cabin wall, knocking loose ice particles on the outer skin. They flew about the capsule, illuminated by the sunlight. Another mechanical failure occurred, however. The pitch horizon scanner, part of the automatic control system, failed. Carpenter assumed control of the craft's systems and manually made the corrections. Due to the malfunction and his fascination with the fireflies, Carpenter overshot his planned re-entry, coming down 402 kilometers off target. When the recovery crew located him, Carpenter was already aboard his life raft beside the capsule. The United States had caught up with two successful orbital flights, manual control of spacecraft attitude, scientific and technical data improving their knowledge base. What would the Soviets do next? The Russian chief designer pulled a rabbit out of his hat. Two, actually. The Russians chalk up another victory in the space race as they put two manned spacecraft into orbit within 24 hours of each other. Colonel Pavel Popovich and Major Andrian Nikolayev follow in the footsteps of two other Russian astronauts, Titov and Gagarin, and thus give the Soviets four manned orbital flights against two for the United States. Within 72 hours, the first man aloft traveled more than a million miles, four times the distance to the moon, a distance it would take a jet airliner two and a half months to fly. Nikolayev reported being able to see Vostok 4 as it attained orbit, with the two cosmonauts chatting briefly over the radio. Neither craft had maneuvering capability. Unable to change their orbital speed, they soon drifted apart. It was the first multiple launch, and the first time more than one human was in space. Again, another propaganda hit, although there was little technical or scientific knowledge gained from the stunt. Nikolaev went on to break more records. The first multi-day flight with a total of 3.93 days and 64 orbits of the Earth. Popovich in Vostok 4 made 48 orbits. A malfunction in the life support system troubled him, taking the cabin temperature down to 10 degrees. Due to a misunderstanding with the ground crew, his flight was terminated early by ground control. They thought Popovich had given them the code word to abort the flight. He landed some seven minutes behind Vostok 3. The Mariner satellite probed Venus 36 million miles away, and work was progressing on Project Rover, a nuclear-powered moon vehicle. Mariner 2 was launched successfully on August 27, 1962. Mariner 2 was the first NASA space probe to successfully encounter another planet, Venus. It was a simplified version of the Ranger spacecraft sent aloft by an Atlas Agena booster combination. It consisted of an instrument package of radiometers, a micrometeorite detector, a solar plasma sensor, charged particle sensor, and a magnetometer. Solar panels provided the power. On the three and a half month journey, Mariner measured the solar winds of charged particles leaving the sun, confirming the Soviet observations from Luna 1. It also detected cosmic rays coming from outside the solar system. The spacecraft passed within 35,000 kilometers of Venus and measured the temperature distribution of the planet's surface, revealing the dense cloud cover of the planet was cool but beneath, Venus had a very hot surface, 425 degrees Celsius. The probe also proved communication with spacecraft at long distances was possible. Those who came before us made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution, the first waves of modern invention, and the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. 
We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. The third orbital flight of Mercury takes off October 3rd, 1962. The first of two longer duration flights, the capsule was christened Sigma 7. Once achieving orbit, Wally Shearer's spacesuit began to overheat, threatening to cancel the flight. He was able to adjust the coolant flow and the temperature was brought under control. He was given the green light for six orbits. The mission was geared towards engineering rather than science. The craft was left to free drift to see if the autopilot system would function properly. Shearer called it the chimp configuration. He then tried steering by the stars, but found it a very difficult task to perfect. The course of his flight took Shearer to the highest manned altitude yet, 283.2 kilometers at apogee, the highest point of his orbit. The flight lasted nine hours, 13 minutes, and Sigma-7 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, this time near the island of Midway, an almost flawless flight. NASA's plans to achieve Kennedy's goal were beginning to materialize. The next generation of spacecraft was beginning to take shape. The Gemini program would take two astronauts into space with a far more sophisticated and maneuverable spacecraft. Three more probes are launched by the Soviet Union, bound for Mars. Mars 1962A was launched on October the 24th, 1962, the booster vehicle functioned well until the final stage exploded. One month later, Mars 1 is launched. It successfully made it to a trans-Mars trajectory. Communications failed en route, and it was never heard of again. A third attempt, Mars 1962b, failed to leave Earth's orbit. It is assumed the upper stage exploded. Aiming closer to home, the Soviets launched Luna 4 in April 1963. Following the previous success of the lunar probes, engineers and scientists were confident. However, this lunar lander missed the moon altogether and is now in a permanent orbit. Space exploration was a difficult and dangerous pursuit. There was still much to be learned before a successful lunar mission could be undertaken. The next Mercury flight was Faith 7, piloted by the larger-than-life Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr., better known as Gordo. He was the youngest of all the Mercury astronauts. The Atlas Mercury 9 was launched on 15 May 1963, the first flight for the year. Prior to launch, Gordo Cooper, who was renowned for being able to sleep anywhere, anytime, had to be awakened by flight control before the launch. This was a long-haul flight lasting over 39 hours and 19 minutes. More time spent in space than all the Mercury astronauts combined. Cooper orbited the Earth 22 times. He did manage to catch a nap in orbit as well. Cooper's mission was the final one of the Mercury series and the last time an American would fly in space alone.
Valentina Tereshkova was so starstruck by the flight of Yuri Gagarin that her fellow workers at the textile factory where she worked nicknamed her Gagarin in a skirt. Born 6 March 1937 and living in the upper Volga, Tereshkova was a trained parachutist but longed to fly in space. She wrote to Moscow asking to become a cosmonaut. She was readily accepted for a number of reasons. First, her father was a tank sergeant and war hero who died in the Finnish Winter War. And secondly, she was a member of the Communist Party. Korolev had suggested sending a woman into space soon after the success of Yuri Gagarin. A female cosmonaut corps was formed, and from 100 applicants, only five made the selection, Tereshkova being one of them. They all received training in rocket theory, spacecraft engineering, weightless flight training, isolation and centrifugal tests. Tereshkova also learned to fly as part of her training. June 14, 1963. Vostok 5, carrying cosmonaut Valery Bikovsky, roars into the sky. Two days later, on the 16th of June, Valentina Tereshkova also lifted off aboard Vostok 6, the first woman in space. Once again, two cosmonauts were in orbit at the same time and for a short period in close proximity to each other. Still with no maneuvering capability, the Vostoks quickly parted company. 26-year-old Tereshkova orbited Earth 48 times in 70 hours and 50 minutes. Mikovsky aboard Vostok 5 went on to a new endurance record of 81 orbits in four days, 23 hours and six minutes, a record for a single occupant spacecraft still held today. Tereshkova would go on to marry cosmonaut Nikolaev. Some believed it to be an arrangement organized by the powers that be. They had a daughter in 1965, but the marriage didn't last. An event that shook not only the United States, but the entire world, proved to be another turning point in America's race for the moon. November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy is shot and killed in Dallas, Texas. The area is a swarm of police, rangers, and secret service men. The murderer slips the net, but a few blocks away, a man is captured after he is reported to have killed a policeman. That man is a 24-year-old pro-Castro Texan who once sought Soviet citizenship. Weeps and melancholy waves over the hushed throng. The one man capable of challenging the Soviet dominance in space had died before seeing his goal of landing a man on the moon come to fruition. With President Johnson and Robert Kennedy. Some thought that with his death, the dream would also die, but it became a rallying point in history. NASA knew they could do it. Congress had already funded the project. And above all, the people of the United States still expected the dream to be achieved even if only to honor the president's wishes. Voskhod was the next project for Korolev, a multi-man crew mission. Using Vostok components, the crew cabin was redesigned. The bulky ejector seat was removed, enabling three couches to be installed. This, however, also removed the escape capability for the three-man crew. Due to the restricted space, they could no longer wear bulky spacesuits and would have to rely entirely on the cabin to maintain an atmosphere. Without ejector seats, the crew would have to ride the capsule back to Earth, landing, unlike the Americans in the ocean, on the ground. Braking rockets were added to the parachute lines to soften the impact of landing. Voskhod 1 was crewed by Vladimir Komarov as commander, Konstantin Fyokistov, an engineer who had worked on the spacecraft design, and Boris Yegorov, a doctor. The latter two were fought for by Korolev against the military and their wish for pilots only. The mission was to be two weeks in duration, and Korolev argued a doctor would be critical to monitor the welfare of the crew and an engineer to fix anything that broke down over such a long mission. They were launched October 12, 1964. Their mission lasted only one day and 16 orbits. Nikita Khrushchev, the power behind the program, was deposed and their mission cut short. The people had no voice in that matter. However, Nikita was always in full voice. When he visited the United Nations, his harangue left the delegates aghast. 
вражды между белыми и черными. The Central Committee pulled the red carpet from beneath Khrushchev and named Leonid Brezhnev as new party leader. Voskhod 1, however, did achieve some significant goals. First multi-crew flight, first doctor and first engineer in space, and they attained an altitude of 383 kilometers at apogee. Voskhod 2 was prepared with a very different goal in mind. March 18, 1965, it was launched with a two-man crew, both wearing spacesuits. Shortly after their first orbit, an inflatable airlock attached to the side of the spacecraft was inflated. And the pilot, Alexei Leonov, exited the spacecraft, leaving Commander Pavel Belyayev inside. The first spacewalk lasted 12 minutes. Leonov remained tethered to the spacecraft, an amazing feat considering the technology of the time. Leonov found his spacesuit stiffening, his hands slipping out of his gloves, and he had great difficulty in trying to get back inside the inflatable airlock. He had to dump some of his suit's pressure to enable him to scramble back inside. Then the two cosmonauts had trouble sealing the hatch, but they eventually succeeded and jettisoned the extended airlock prior to re-entry. To cap off the mission, they landed miles off course, and it took a day for the capsule to be found. The two cosmonauts had spent the night in the snowbound capsule surrounded by wolves. Leonov's spacewalk was yet another international propaganda spectacular. The Americans still trailed behind in the race for the moon. However, the new Gemini spacecraft was nearing readiness and would soon prove America's capabilities and finally eclipse the Soviets in space.